All right. I just want to welcome everybody today on behalf of ULI Pittsburgh. Um, and I know we're all excited to hear about uh, the visionary places and our finalists in that category today. Um, Robin, thank you very much for all your hard work in, in getting this, uh, this group together. And we're really looking forward to the presentations. So again, I, I don't want to hold anything up. I know we've got a full schedule and some great things to talk about. So welcome, thank you, and take it away, Robin. Okay. So one of the thing, first things we'll do is uh, thank our annual sponsors, which you see on the screen there. And then um, these are our event sponsors for the uh, placemaking awards, again, May 12th at the Highline. So if you haven't registered, please do so. Uh, some of you have seen this video previously. Uh, we're gonna show it again. Uh, the shortened version, so enjoy. Placemaking is the intersection of building and engineering, plus commerce, plus creativity. It's the moment when those things come together. There's lots of different kinds of placemaking, but it's the fundamental part of it is a, it's a place where people want to be. It attracts people, it creates spontaneity, it, it, Creates magic. Other than physical attributes, things that make a space great have to do with the culture and passion that's coming out of that space. Okay. Place making. Well, all right, so um, kind of a quick definition of visionary place. And this is the only award for Pittsburgh ULI that uh, recognizes a project that's not been completed. Um, so when the jury uh, reviewed a lot of the um, applications, uh, we were really looking for kind of the projects that have a vision and look at uh, what could be and will significantly impact uh, the lifestyle in the region. And I think all three projects uh, in their own way are exemplifying uh, this award. So congratulations to the three finalists. And the first one is Fifth and Dinwiddie Development. And uh, we have Derek Tillman, who's the president and CEO of Bridging the Gap Development, and Amanda Markovic, uh, principal of GBBN. So, um, at this time, uh, Derek and Amanda, if you would unmute and um, uh, kind of tell us a little bit about the project. I'll start um, running through the slides and um, you guys can let me know, um, you know, who wants to comment on those. It sounds good. I'll, I'll kick us off. Okay, great. Uh, thanks again, Robin, um, for this opportunity, um, Lisa as well. Um, this project is known as Fifth and Dinwiddie. It is the development based in Uptown, uh, the Eco Innovation District. We're developing both sides of the street. Um, you see the, uh, the bigger building on the left is known as the West Site. This is mixed use, um, mixed income, um, mainly residential with also a resident, uh, retail component. And the site on the right is known as the East site. This is also mixed use um, with a focus on commercial. Um, next slide. So you've kind of gone over those. Okay, here we go. Okay. Um, so th the project, what was important to us is, uh, you know, that the project was consistent with the UN SDGs, the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This really just shows how the project weaves through all these different components, um, whether we're talking about affordable and clean energy, uh, decent work and economic growth, uh, climate action, or uh, really developing sustainable cities and communities. Our focus here, although the project encapsulates all of these, is really on reducing fuel poverty, um, but also uh, enhancing equitable indoor air quality. Next slide. 
So to do that, we had to really start with the end in mind by putting together what's called an OPR, an owner's project requirements. And with this, really uh, communicating to my team all the things that were important to me. And we looked at things uh, related to the community, uh, energy, indoor air quality, indoor environmental quality, landscaping materials, operations and maintenance, waste, water, as well as transportation. Uh, within this OPR, uh, everyone has a responsibility. This allows us to be on the same page and really stay in sync, but also as a, a tool that allows me to hold uh, the team accountable um, to implementing these goals. Next slide. Uh, the, both projects, the east and the west, west site, will be uh, cert passive house certified. Passive house is one of the highest levels of energy efficiency and sustainability, uh, reduces energy costs by north of 70%, and really focuses on thermal comfort uh, for the occupants as well as the residents. Both projects will be FitWell certified. FitWell focuses on uh, public health research. It's uh, built on public health research. It uh, reduces morbidity and absenteeism uh, for uh, vulnerable populations. Um, it also really just incorporates a lot of healthy living and healthy lifestyle components, whether you're talking about eating, exercising, et cetera. And there's a set of standards and metrics um, that are employed um, to uh, incorporate the certification. Um, both projects will also be RESET AIR certified. RESET AIR focuses on uh, indoor air quality. Um, this is the first multifamily on the west side, multifamily project in the nation that will also actually incorporate RESET AIR. It's been utilized in commercial, but never before in multifamily. Um, the projects will be compliant with the city's MWBE goals, um, which will definitely look to uh, exceed those and uh, compliant with well building as well as lead. Next slide. Uh, as we always focus on bridging the gap, as we say, we don't just build buildings, but we're also focused on building people, which ultimately builds stronger communities. So definitely a commitment to providing opportunities for MWEs. Uh, we hired an MBE GC on the east site, representing a $12 million development project. There's community opportunity, as well as we're doing a training program focused on clean energy jobs. So really teaching folks in the community how to do things like how to install solar panels, things of that nature. We have uh, partners that will facilitate uh, this program. And then mixed income uh, housing, as well as some affordable commercial space. Next slide. Uh, the project is really uh, focused intently and intentionally on equitable development and social development. So we are restoring an underutilized public works building, um, you know, building an addition that essentially doubles the size of the, of the area, uh, really having a catalytic transformational impact on this commercial corridor. This is a high level, top notch sustainable development being led by a Black developer. Um, there's new construction of major mixed, uh, of this major mixed use development. This project includes re residential, retail, commercial, as well as a public plaza that is intended to really bring people together and provide community. Uh, high quality design as well as construction, and then creating a community hub of opportunities for local small businesses, as well as community-based organizations and stakeholders. Um, next slide. The project, uh, again, we have retail that everyone will be excited about supporting. Um, opportunity where we engage local artists to showcase public art, showcase public art, um, expanded opportunities for MWBEs, and development without displacement of both residential as well as commercial. Next slide. This is the location, um, Fifth and Dinwiddie, which is in Uptown. You can see it's centrally located between downtown, Oakland, as well as the Hill District. So we're literally bridging a gap between these communities. Next slide. This really just shows the site uses people in motion. Um, the, the site will be along the BRT. We'll have actually a, a stop um, right in front of the building, making it very accessible for public transportation. Um, also bike parking, 
um, and then really just uh, opportunities for walking um, throughout the site, including uh, the public realm. This public realm over 12,000 square feet of open space we will really work with the community to really have some outdoor uh, programming um, that we're very excited about. Next slide. Um, the project again, that the West site is uh, 171 units, 80% uh, market rate, 20% affordable, and 12,000 square feet of retail uh, at, at the first, first level. Um, the East site is over 40,000 square feet of uh, office space, which includes 2,600 square feet of retail. Uh, that retail is intended to be a coffee shop, and the commercial will include, uh, you know, regular commercial office space, um, you know, uh, flex office space, um, and then that training space for uh, for clean energy jobs. Uh, with that, I'll pass it over to Amanda. Next slide. Thank you, Derek. Um, so as uh, this is the east site, and the east site includes a building that will. Uh, we will be utilizing as adaptive reuse for the, um, this former public works building. Our goal is to transform this 20,000 square foot building into a place that really speaks of investment, becoming an asset to the community. Next slide. And so our intent is to infill the surface parking lot at the corner and provide a, three, a third story on top of the existing. Um, essentially adding another 20,000 square feet of space. The first floor will include the reuse of the existing highway space for the, um, the innovation to support the local workforce development that Derek just mentioned. Um, the addition at the ground level will have a coffee shop to, to really meet the demand of the uh, travelers that will be coming to this intersection. Um, this will also serve as the main entry into the building at the plaza connection from the west. Um, the second story includes the publicly accessed terrace with an interior space that can be utilized by the building and the community as a meeting space. Um, next slide. The massing was developed to reduce impact of views down Dinwiddie from the hill. Um, this allows for visibility, not just around the building, but also to these new public amenities creating a sense of belonging and opportunities for social interaction. Next slide. Throughout the project, we've, in, for East and West, um, strategically designed windows to maximize views um, and useful solar heat gain while minimizing excessive heat gain. Um, through passive house design and the, of the addition and of the existing building, um, our PEUI estimate of 14 to 20 is just shy of our 80% reduction goal for the AIA 2030 commitment. Next slide. Hopping over to the West site, um, as mentioned, there will be 171 units. Among this total, 20% of them will be committed to affordable housing, targeting three different levels of income. Um, the diagram here is showing um, one of the residential floors of the West site. Um, with the intent of really integrating um, the uh, neighborhood community within the building. Next slide. Um, for the urban infill at the west site, the project will add density to the Fifth Avenue corridor, transforming the intersection to become a civic plaza. Along with the certifications that Derek reviewed, uh, the site will also utilize CLT offsite construction for the residential work above the concrete and steel podium. Next slide. The west site is subdivided by the alleyway, um, our way. Here you can begin to see how this upper plaza will be utilized by the community. This is the primary residential entrance and the connecting bridge above becomes a threshold to the community space beyond. The upper plaza also connects to the primary entrance at the west site, which would be behind us in this view. Next slide. The potential to weave those three certifications together in a new building really will set a standard for our region that developing for the well being of the community as a priority is feasible and affordable. The project will also look, work as a laboratory to study providing valuable information through open integrated measurement and verification tools to demonstrate the cost and benefit ratio of passive house construction as it relates to well-being. 
Next slide. And there's a consistent effort throughout the project to connect the residents with nature and the neighborhood in terms of views and access, lower operating and utility costs. Um, there will be very long-term impacts because the project reduces carbon emissions, addresses safety and access and social connections and creates social connections. Next slide. Our way um, will become a newly welcoming space. Um, what you're seeing here are some outdoor living rooms for the community engaging with all ages um, with public art uh, on the walls. There will be misters, various musical play elements, creating tremendous opportunity for block parties. Next slide. At the interior, we strived to utilize natural elements throughout and showcase the CLT construction as much as possible. The living units will include all electric appliances, further improving air quality to reduce health burdens such as asthma. Next slide. Here you can better see the overall site at the lower plaza. Uh, we have the BRT shelter, an intimate covered stadium seating that can be utilized for several different types of events. Um, trees and filling the plaza where a slope sidewalk provides universal access to the upper plaza. And there will be bike and scooter share, um, the outdoor living rooms along our way. And there will be also a small roof terrace for all residents of the building and high performance windows, making the interior space very comfortable. Derek. You're on mute, Derek. <laughs> oh, and in closing, we wanted to be intentional about integrating public art throughout the site. So we engaged with uh, local public artists, Marlet, I'm sorry, uh, Mo and Charlotte Koff, um, to uh, develop um, some, some uh, curated art pieces that we can uh, integrate and really become uh, part of the design um, to incorporate culture, uh, history as, as well as working with these artists. Mo, uh, Mo actually learned to play um, jazz in, in this alleyway of our way. And um, one of the pieces, you can go to the next slide, one of the pieces that uh, and, and things that they talked about was a, a, uh, they would say, hey, hey man, play, play that number, man. Um, so he actually curated a piece called Play That Number, man, that will be uh, uh, you know, a part of our overall design. Um, so we're excited about uh, how this element, um, you know, really uh, takes what we're already doing that is great to, to a whole nother level. Um, next slide. So with that, we uh, thank you all for your time and attention. Um, and this project is uh, fifth and Billy. Well, thank you very much. Uh, a couple questions that uh, kind of we've asked all the finalists and um, obviously, this is a very visionary project from the presentation, and I congratulate you on that. Uh, can you tell us a little bit of how the project got initiated and kind of uh, the thought process behind taking on this development? So the project came about through an RFP released through the URA. Um, the URA worked with the Neighborhood Community Group Uptown Partners. They went through a two-year uh, planning process to develop the Eco Innovation District. Um, we put together an amazing team to respond and ultimately uh, what were the successful um, respondents. Um, within that response, we wanted to be uh, responsive to uh, the work that had went into the Eco Innovation District plan, but also recognizing um, that Uptown is a part uh, of the Greater Hill District. So our project also um, was intentional about um, integrating and being responsive and in alignment with not only the Eco Innovation District Plan, but also the Greater Hill District Master Plan. Um, and then, uh, you know, really thinking about how can we bridge gaps, um, you know, uh, within on this corridor. So really responding to what the community needs as, as it relates to this community, um, recognizing we're still in the affordable housing crisis. So although the RFP only required 10% affordable, we recognized that the community needed more. So we doubled the requirement, um, even though it wasn't technically a requirement, um, but really weaving through all these different components um, and then being intentional about uh, enhancing uh, and leading 
as it relates to uh, sustainable development and reducing the carbon footprint. So the project came, that's how it came about. And, and we worked together to, to weave uh, these different components that ultimately bridge different gaps. Excellent. Um, so when do you anticipate completion? So uh, the, the east site um, is estimated about a 12, 12 month, 12 to 14 month construction uh, timeframe. So uh, we're thinking fall of 2023 um, to complete the east site. And the west site is anticipated to be a, about a 20 month um, construction timeframe. So that's gonna take us into 2024. Great. Well, we appreciate your comments and everything and uh, good luck on the 12th. And uh, we hope to see you at uh, Highline. So uh, we'll move on to our next uh, finalist and that's the UPMC Vision and Rehabilitation Hospital at UPMC Mercy. And we have Mike Chapetta, the project director, Joe Shields, the project manager, and from HOK, Wayne Nichols, and so I will um, welcome those three folks. And I guess you guys are all in the same room. Yes, we are. Well, that makes it uh, easy. <laughs> so I'll uh, go ahead and start uh, moving the slides and you guys can uh, comment and tell me when to move on if I can't figure it out myself. Well, thank you, Robin, uh, for the opportunity today to present uh, a project that is now called the UPMC Mercy Pavilion. Uh, we've changed the name here recently and haven't quite updated everything, but uh, UPMC Mercy Pavilion is going to be the home of the UPMC Ophthalmology Department and the UPMC Physical Medicine and Rehab Institute. Uh, Dr. Jose Sahel, who UPMC recruited, will lead the Ophthalmology Department here at UPMC, and Dr. Gwen So is our lead for the rehabilitation uh, side of things. So I'm going to actually turn this over to Wayne now, and he's going to take you through our slide presentation. All right. Uh, go ahead and go to the next slide. Yeah, so, you know, we our site is um, also in Uptown, uh, very near the other one that we just looked at. And it, what this project is doing is, is really bringing a, a new level of uh, innovation to uh, Mercy Hospital as a, as a part of UPMC and trying to create a bridge uh, between the hospital and the community, a physical one as it creates also to help add into the innovation district and, and bring new, uh, new opportunities to the neighborhood. So if you keep going to the next slide, um, we, in the design, we're, we're very uh, intentional in, in integrating the project with the existing campus and, and in trying to make a bridge to the neighborhood. So the, the massing steps down as it gets from the tallest portion of it on the left, which is the west for the lower portions on the east. And then one of the critical elements too is was the continuation of the existing Mercy uh, Park uh, on the north side of the existing hospital and bringing that across the north side of ours as well uh, to really create this link and between the two of them create a nice green space in the, in, you know, in the heart of Uptown. Um, keep going to, to the next slide. So walking around the project a little bit, of, going kind of fast, but that's right. That was previously we were you know, walking from um, down Locust Street, which is a, a critical connection to us because there is the blind and vision rehabilitation services down that way. And there'd be a lot of work going on between uh, that institution and the ophthalmology department that's going on here where they're doing both clinical services and uh, groundbreaking research. So we can keep moving along um, to the next slide, please. You know, the whole project is oriented toward the north, toward that Mercy Park. It's where all of the main entrances are. Uh, as, as well as you know, this connection to the community with a, with a place where we're really trying to get active engagement, uh, both of uh, users of the building, uh, visitors who are patients, uh, researchers, and others, as well as uh, people in the community. And move on to the next slide. Um, that again, the same area, looking at how we've got very open glassy facade of two uh, primary entries to the building on that side, um, connected directly into this open park. And you'll also see a hint there of a roof garden, uh, which we will uh, touch on a little bit. There's another means of creating a, a connection to the community that's uh, certainly a less direct physical connection, but one that will be important to the occupants of this building and how they experience uh, the greater part of Uptown. Uh, moving on to the next slide. This then uh, finally is, an, is a 
impact of the outside where we are uh, from in front of Mercy Hospital, looking back toward the east, um, you see the mass of the tower element, which is the primary home of the research uh, functions of the project, where we are changing from the brick expression at the base, which really uh, integrates well with Mercy Hospital across the street, to a more modern uh, expression of a uh, curtain wall with integrated terracotta to, to link that and make that uh, you know, play base up through the entirety of the tower. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, focusing in then on, on the park in front of the building, uh, this is our primary drop-off certainly as well, but uh, also one where we are uh, creating several different gathering spaces within the park that are, there's a couple of them that are oriented toward the building, a couple also that are oriented down toward the community. There's a significant grade elevation across this and we've got several different pieces that occupy that as it comes up. We are also currently uh, have a competition out for uh, public art to be integrated into this space. Moving on to the next uh, slide. A couple more views of this. Uh, one of the other things we wanted to touch on is, is indicated, uh, hinted at with this image on the right, is that we are making a significant effort to upgrade the pedestrian infrastructure, both immediately around the site and also down Locust Street to the east toward the blind and vision rehabilitation services to make it much uh, more functional for uh, people with low vision or who are fully blind. Uh, if you were to walk that now, it, it's very, very difficult to get across with lots of very little curbs and you know, curb cuts and things. So it, it's, it's a very unsafe walk right now and we will be upgrading that to make it a, a much more uh, acceptable uh, pathway. Moving on to the next slide. The primary, the two primary entrances to the building, as I mentioned earlier, we, we are already these atrium spaces, these glass facades facing to the north. We're bringing this uh, brick expression into that building and really trying to open up as best we can the, the, the floors where the clinical services are being uh, performed. Uh, to, to, and you know, when you're in this space, whether here coming into the, uh, to the main entry in the lobby or what the two upper floors, which have waiting areas for our uh, clinics and our outpatient surgery suite. Uh, you will have this a very strong visual connection out to the neighborhood and the neighborhood will have that visual connection. And these areas are also going to be having some public art and be meant for openness so the community members can come in and appreciate that art as well as those who are coming to the building uh, you know, for uh, their services. Next slide. This is the East Atrium. Uh, there is the intent here to have a uh, down at the lower level um, changing exhibitions for our work. So we've got elements on, within that space that enable that. Uh, and then it will as well be a permanent uh, public art that is likely to be suspended from the ceiling of the space. And moving on to the next slide. I want to talk a little bit about this, this upper uh, terrace area. So up on the fourth floor of the building, where is really the, the programmatic knuckle of it, um, where the clinical and the research uh, components of the program come together. Uh, and at this area, we have a conference center that will be available for public use at times. Um, and with that, we've got a, a, an open gathering space there that you see in the image on the top, which is overlooking the, the west atrium entrance. It is outside our primary conference room. Uh, and it also opens then out to the terrace that you, you see there in the bottom right, which is um, really just another outdoor gathering space. And this is a, a space that is protected on three sides uh, from the wind. So, you know, even in a, it's a little bit more extended of use for the seasons than uh, many outdoor spaces in Pittsburgh otherwise would. Um, but the other half of that outdoor space, if you go to the next slide, uh, that's just another view of that, that space looking out on it. Um, if you go to the next slide, the other half of that space is actually a clinical. Uh, so for both the low vision and the rehab, um, functions of this, there's a key element of, of, of their services is to help people to understand how to live with their limitations, uh, whether that is somebody who is losing their uh, physical mobility or somebody losing their vision. And so aside from doing that inside the building, we're also doing it outside. And you'll see in the, the plan on the lower right, the bottom half of that is this clinical garden where you have a number of different um, surface conditions to help people understand how they're walking on different kinds of paved surfaces on a grass surface. We've got um, ramps for the sidewalk uh, as, as, as well as so different forms of seating 
And so it will really perform an actual clinical function going through there. If you go to the next slide, um, this you get a sense of that where you get the waiting area for those services uh, on the left in that image to the left where the all clinics are. And then to the right, you've got the view out into the, um, the healing garden slash rehabilitation garden, um, where again, as you see in that image of the light, it, it's, it's creating a what will be quite beautiful um, and, and attractive outdoor space that will also again serve this clinical function. And uh, another view of that, and here you can see an initial idea for that suspended uh, artwork there in the background for the in the East Atrium. Um, still to be determined what that is going to be. Sorry. No. Oh, that's it. Your finger there. <laughs> but the, you can go on the next slide, and this is just a you know a, a nighttime view of the building uh, you know, from uptown on the north side. Well, it sounds like another exciting project in uptown, and. Uh, you guys should be congratulated for quite the uh, visual that you provided. Um, perhaps you guys could comment on kind of how this came about. I think you mentioned, uh, you know, the need to have this at the Mercy site, but can you comment a little bit more about uh, how the project got initiated and um, kind of site selection? Sure. Um, so this project really started several years ago when UPMC uh, recruited Dr. Sahel uh, to come to the United States and to bring his uh, world-renowned ophthalmology uh, clinic and research that he was doing in France. Um, when, when, he, when he agreed to, to join UPMC, we needed to look uh, really at a new facility for his work because the ophthalmology services we provided at that time uh, were, were below his standards and what his needs for research would be. So uh, that brought us to the Mercy campus where there was already a large ophthalmology clinic here, uh, but it also uh, tied in, and Wayne kind of alluded to this, that there's some synergies between the work that Dr. Sahel does and the work that Dr. Gwen Soa does with her, um, her rehabilitation work. Dr. Soa is a world-renowned doctor uh, who specializes in um, severe spinal and brain injuries. So uh, there, there's a lot of synergies in the work and the rehabilitation work they do with those types of patients and the type of work that Dr. Sell and his team does with uh, those with vision impairments. So it was, it was, a, it was the need to create a space that the two, those two doctors continue their work uh, here. And, and Mercy Campus was an ideal location for that. First, it's just part of the mission of Mercy that governs UPMC Mercy uh, and its longstanding tradition. It's, uh, we're actually celebrating our 100, 175th year uh, in existence here uh, in Uptown. Uh, it, is the, uh, it was the first uh, Mission of Mercy Hospital in the United States uh, when it opened. And so uh, that was also played a factor in, in picking this site and how this project came to be here in Uptown. Uh, What's been uh, the feedback from the community and, and kind of as this construction continues and uh, you're now seeing it coming out of the ground, let's say? We worked with Uptown Partners uh, throughout the design process. Uh, they were included in, in our meetings and, and were able to provide us feedback. Uh, we've also worked with them on uh, some of the public art uh, work that we've done to date that Wayne referenced. Uh, uh, and, and we actually brought uh, one of their, we brought their most, uh, their director through um, about two weeks ago for a tour and we're trying to arrange another tour for them. Uh, so far the feedback's been positive, we know the construction in any neighborhood creates uh, some challenges and, and we try to be very mindful of those uh, while we're working through this process. Uh, we, we wanna be good neighbors. And uh, we really think that uh, when this project is done, it's gonna be a benefit to Uptown. Uh, one of the things that we, we didn't really include in this presentation is the, the first floor of the building. We'll have several components that are, are retail-based that uh, will be available to the community. So we're gonna have an ophthalmology shop uh, your, your, your standard type of uh, glasses and contact type shop uh, on the first floor. Uh, we'll also have a pharmacy on the first floor that'll be open to the public as well as serving the patients of the building and the hospital. Um, there will be a, a food service area on the first floor that during, uh, while the building is open will be available to the public. Um, and one of the features that we think is new, not only to Pittsburgh, but uh, the first of its kind in the United States is on the first floor, there's gonna be an, urgent care ophthalmology center. 
So this will be uh, extended hours late into the evening on weekends uh, that will specialize in ophthalmology needs um, for those who, who, who may have an accident over the, oh, you know, at a non-normal business hour time and, and need to see an ophthalmologist. Great. Um, and uh, completion is scheduled for when? Uh, we're end of the year. And end of December of this year, and then that's for substantial completion. Then we have our rounds of testing and move in probably in the first quarter of 22 and hopeful 23. I'm sorry, first quarter of 23, and then knock on wood, first patients in May of 2023. Well, excellent. Thank you very much for your uh, presentation and your comments. Um, like, you know, Uptown, I moved here 20 years ago, and I always thought that Uptown should be a great part of the city, and uh, your project and Derek's project are definitely moving in the right direction, and, and both of these projects, uh, when they're completed, probably uh, would suggest ap applying for other awards with the uh, placemaking. So, again, thank you very much, and we'll move on to our third finalist which is the heart of Main Street, Braddock. And um, we have uh, Ken Doino from the Rothschild Doino Collaborative and uh, some other representatives, including Greg Gander, who uh, we had on a, a few months ago about the O-Ringer. And that was a very enlightening presentation. So we're looking forward to hearing more about the heart of Maine and its visionary components. So. Ken, I'll uh, move the slides and you can comment. Thank you, Robin, and thank you to uh, everybody here. It's uh, delightful to see all these projects and to see all the great changes going on in the city and in Uptown in particular. I'm um, not sure why this picture got cut off, but we will continue to, to carry on. <laughs> there, there's um, a project here is focused on a, a sequence of change in Braddock, Pennsylvania. And uh, it has culminated most recently in the Oranger Arts Building, but involves essentially where the former um, hospital site was in downtown Braddock uh, and their main street that has really suffered from uh, really decades and decades of decline and loss and a community that has made a, a concerted effort uh, to definitively say, we're gonna turn around and propel our community forward. Um, we can go to the next slide here. Hopefully it will come through all the way here. So. Um, yeah, this starts to give you a sense of some of the projects that have been uh, accumulated around the center of uh, Braddock Avenue's Main Street here over um, multiple decades at this point. We're moving, uh, really started working on the Avenue apartment, the upper left-hand side in 2009, uh, and that was starting to be uh, completed when the demolition of the hospital was announced uh, and the closing of the hospital was announced. And the community put together a vision for the entire Main Street that was pursued through numerous efforts, which we'll go into here for a little bit. And we can go into the next slide here. Um, significantly, I think, in this happening was the Avenue Apartments, which was the first project that was for seniors. It was actually being selected and built on that site specifically because of its adjacency to the hospital, ironically. Um, but it was designed in such a manner to be responsive to the surroundings and reflect uh, with the community upon uh, the uh, character of the, of the neighborhood and the main street as a focal point. And Ralph Falbo and Penrose, but Ralph Falbo was the developer of this. Uh, it was a, a, a affordable senior housing um, uh, pursued through the PHFA LIHTC program. Uh, and the integrated artwork at the time uh, grew from stories. So we held a workshop uh, that Ralph uh, really sponsored and was focused on in the community uh, in which we gathered stories about Main Street from the neighbors. Uh, and this was before the sort of longer story was known, but certainly there was a long story going backwards. Um, and the stories talked about all the vibrancy and activity that was uh, characteristic of the neighborhood and its a day. Uh, and we thought that that was a very important component to be reflected. And then Ralph engaged uh, Robert Qualters, who you see in the right-hand side there, to start to do portraits of that history. And these are actually exterior paintings um, that were uh, developed and placed on the outside of the building on the Main Street sidewalk 
and they tell the story. So each of those, um, each of those uh, uh, paintings have stories that wrap around the perimeter and then imagery that develops. And those created an outdoor art gallery in front of the below grade parking garage that's accessed here. Um, other critical components to that site um, included the fact that 4th Street lines up and all of the public spaces line up with the street across the way, kind of creating illumination uh, at the Main Street and kind of kicking off that sense of Main Street being occupied again. Uh, and then also significantly, um, the entrance was on the corner responding to the hospital site to the right. Uh, and in that uh, Main Street, in that Main Street celebration area here, uh, there's a, a memory wall that has the names of all the stores that used to be in Braddock at the time, uh, back in its heyday. Next slide, please. Um, and it was uh, almost at completion when the hospital announced that it was going to be closing this uh, facility. And you can see what a significant you know, facility it was on this site. Uh, and the, the senior housing is, was immediately next to that. And uh, the community um, uh, really worked hard to say, well, we need to create a positive vision for our Main Street. Uh, the county uh, asserted strongly that the, the site needed to be cleared and that there needed to be some resources provided to the community to build forward onto that site. And those were negotiated. It was uh, the last uh, press conference of the uh, former county executive to say we have a vision now for the site. But most significantly, um, Bedco and Mon Valley Initiative um, convened a series of community meetings to say, how do we create a future for this Main Street that has been declining for so long uh, that we have a positive um, imagination and understanding of that future? Uh, and go to the next slide here. Sorry, some of the fonts seem to have gone a little catty pompous. Um, uh, but here you can see then the corner of the, of the Avenue apartment site, just as this opened uh, and, and that turning up into the neighborhood because the neighborhood uh, up the street was a neighborhood that has continued to be a strong residential neighborhood and really a core of the strength of Braddock were, was uh, not just the history of that main street, but the present uh, people who were moving in, renovating houses. Um, and so the county said, we need to be, have a clear vision. This also gives you another view of that gallery on the street here. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the Main Street plan identified uh, that Braddock need to focus on all the different ways in which it supported community as a place to live. Uh, and that's the former hospital site in the middle of that and the senior housing site to the left. And that that was uh, identified through the planning process as the most critical component to make progress on right away. Uh, also, there, that's a hardworking community with a lot of industrial and, and mixed income or mixed uh, uses uh, in the entrance area here, that there's an area for exchange and trade that's really critical and a lot of vacant sites in between that needed to be clear, um, cleared and cleaned up and maintained. Um, and then as a place for growth with youth services and the Braddock project really creating uh, uh, the gardening projects and some other efforts uh, towards the Edgar Thompson work site. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, so that's interesting. That's from the other project. <laughs> Hopped into the slide here. Um, not sure how that happened, but um, uh, so the, the 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 foundation of the community reconciliation and and vision planning here was finding a mix between what the goals of were the community members what the goals were um, that needed to have uh, physical uh, change uh, and that has actually been happening here because the, there was deterioration that had happened and there really were buildings that were fa falling down. Uh, and then uh, the funding sources, the county investors, what were going to attract people to Braddock um, and how could we organize around the, the government, uh, the economic pr uh, provisions and then the physical needs of the community. Uh, and uh, that planning uh, outline really became the foundation uh, for the shared vision. You go to the next slide, please. Hopefully we'll see what's there. Um, okay, more things missing, but um, <laughs> not sure what's going on graphically here, but this, was, uh, this gives you some sense perhaps uh, of just the economic makeup of the households 
um, and that Braddock as a community um, really consisted of um, a lot of lower income households um, and that that uh, that is characteristic of a lot of the neighborhoods in the area. If you were to see the underlying uh, colors there, you'd also see where there is growth and reduction in the different households. But critically, um, between 2011 and 2019, Braddock stopped, stopped losing population, started to slow in its loss of population. North Braddock actually started to increase in its population. Um, and uh, we see some of those changes happening in those surrounding neighborhoods. Go to the next slide, please. Uh, so what is it that's going to welcome change in order to start a chapter of growth? Um, Braddock, which uh, is this top line here, that's what that says there, that says Braddock and North Braddock. Again, not sure what's going on graphically here, but um, uh, those, each of these communities had their peak populations many, many decades ago. Um, so Braddock had its peak population. It was the highest at 20,000 and it went down to less than 2,000 uh, by 2020. Uh, and so really trying to understand a pathway uh, and a course for Braddock to have uh, optimism about its change and start to become um, a, a, the nadir uh, rather than a continuing decline has been an effort um, that's, that's been a focal point of that community as well as other Mon Valley communities. But we can see that some grew later and peaked later and uh, really haven't, re haven't lost as much of the population. Braddock is at 10% of its peak population. Uh, and so the imperative to grow and have a vision for growth. We also can see significantly in the upper right-hand side, just how much infrastructure and building and built uh, area there is within that community. So there's a lot of physical assets. Next slide, please. Um, so the Main Street plan came up with a host of different approaches um, specifically to manage that decline um, and then to manage the physical assets and to make that appear and attract new investment. And that new investment um, really has started to move forward significantly through a host of different efforts. Next slide, please. Uh, the first of which, um, well, we can go to the next slide, the highest priority of which for the community was the hospital site. So, oh boy, we go to the next slide here. Won't even attempt that one. <laughs> Um, that was the hospital site, and the primary goal of this site whoops, was to connect the neighborhood above to the Main Street, so that Main Street was not seen just as a declined business district, but was a connection to the residential district. Next slide, please. Uh, the first project of that was the Overlook Housing, uh, which was 24 houses uh, put up on the hillside that really indicated, you know, with a grand scale, that there was a neighborhood connected across up above um, and that that neighborhood continued to both sides uh, of, of, um, of the community and really brought the views up from Main Street so that one could see up uh, and sort of prominent on the hill how important the uh, residential community is. Interestingly, that church had closed and, and shortly after this project was completed, that church was uh, 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 had a new congregation purchase it and is a church again. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, following that was 501 uh, Braddock, which was uh, provided health care in the community again with an urgent care center uh, and office space and artist housing. Uh, and then the third component of this was the a park space put in the middle in between all of them to weave them all together. Next slide, please. Uh, 501 Braddock started to reflect some of the rhythm and materials across the street uh, and, and some of the colors. And you can see the relationship between 501 Braddock and the Overlook Housing. Um, this was Trek Development and, and Mystic Construction. We built both of those first two projects. Uh, and then there was the park space in between, which we'll come back to showing in a little bit. But go back one slide if you could. Um, we'll see if these things show up, but I know this is represented. Uh, interestingly then, as this was completed, uh, the Brew Gentlemen uh, moved into this space here. The free store was established by Giselle Fetterman and Mon Valley Initiative took on uh, the restoration of the project immediately across the street, the Free Press Building. So we started to see other investment happening around this, as well as, as I mentioned, the church 
uh, having an occupancy. And then critically, Mon Valley Initiative was able to work uh, with Bedco uh, to get grants with the county to create the park space at the center of the community uh, that Trek Development had sort of carved out of their development um, to create this uh, vision plan. Next slide, please. One more. Uh, the next group down, this place for exchange actually uh, becomes, back one slide, um, was the, the vision for this site uh, for the next two blocks of Main Street, really at the center of it was the Oranger building that had been long uh, vacant and had been attempted to have New Hope brought to it. Um, and that uh, really came to a, a whole different future through um, uh, when, when Greg Kander stepped in after having developed at the far north end of Braddock, the Superior Motor site, um, Greg took on the site uh, and um, brought together us and others uh, around pursuit of a lie tech and historic tax credit uh, to redevelop the, the furniture store, the eight story Oranger building at the center of the community in the center of Main Street. You can go to the next slide here. And then there's Greg actually on the phone here, uh, on the Zoom here, if he wants to talk a little bit about this uh, specifically. I was actually looking for me on the phone on the rooftop there, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, because I was there that night. That was July 4th, and oh my gosh, what a night that was to just see the whole world lit up. But anyway, I know we don't have a lot of time, and uh, just two quick learnings for me personally that I want to share. Um, one, I want to um, appreciate architecture and just you know, I've said this before, I liken it to, you know, a good paint job is 95% preparation and the paint job comes after. Uh, and I think any good building design is 95% of what the architecture is uh, and, and the design phase and what Ken and his team did to make everybody else look great. I just uh, really appreciate it. But the, the second big learning, and it's really Ken's really demonstrating it here is just how one building leads to another and leads to another. And, and really what I'm most proud of about the Oringer project is not even the Oringer itself, but it's the things that are coming out of it. And that, uh, that right behind it, you know, we had a minority contractor uh, who did all the drywall and locks in the building and they just bought the trades, uh, built a, bought a building behind to turn it into a trade skill to school to teach the youth of Braddock, you know, uh, valuable trade and good paying union jobs. Uh, we got Shana who opened up a hair salon, you know, a little bit down the block, a hundred yards the other way, another building just went under contract. I know even Derek on this call, uh, he has his hands on a potential project out there that I hope we see him next year and the year after winning awards for, for his next project out in Braddock. So uh, I, I really, one thing leads to another and uh, I could talk about this project for days, but this is really just part of the sequence of the different things that flow. But we have 37 artists who are also just bringing vitality to the street and interesting things and bringing that gallery space alive. Uh, so I'm just thankful it's there. And, uh, and I, I like how Ken is presenting this is this is there's no one standalone that makes anything happen. And, and just like what they're doing in Uptown, those two great projects are going to lead to other projects uh, in the Uptown area. So that's what I find so terrific about these building projects, more what's going to come from it than the building itself. And it's such a neat photo here too, because the activation happening at all these levels, having uh, the rooftop that Greg personally put out as a passion, uh, very difficult to get a rooftop approved on a historic tax credit. Um, you know, this was a, a modern building that was recognized for its historic uh, impact and, and importance. Uh, the, 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 effort to, to restore the sign and to reconstruct that, uh, to get a rooftop uh, occupancy and activity. And just to tie this all together, you can see the senior housing, Avenue apartments, the Overlook apartments, 501 Braddock, uh, the Mon Valley uh, initiatives and Brett Bedco's uh, park space here. Um, the uh, uh, free, Brew Gentleman uh, free store, uh, other uh, redevelopments along this end of the street. Mon Valley is now working up here uh, on additional housing um, in the community. There's other restoration projects happening here. Uh, Greg has been working on the site across the street. Uh, and there's, as we know, really a lot of other sites and vacancies and opportunities here to continue to carry Braddock forward into the future. 
can go to the next slide. This is kind of fun. That activation <laughs> down at the street level there, um, just to see the scale of the activity there on its uh, dollar day once upon a time. And then the rest restored the storefront here. And, and Greg has activated it at the storefront level by allowing the front commercial space to be utilized by those 37 artists in running a gallery space that have activity and display the artwork of a, uh, and the work of what's being made in that uh, maker space, if you will, of a building and a making community uh, right at this very critical corner. Uh, and the Oranger stores, um, you know, sort of peak population was long ago. So really getting this activity and the welcoming new residents is really a critical piece of that. So we're back to the uh, back to the overview. And um, so thank you very much and apologies for some of the uh, uh, transfer of information from yours to ours. Um, but I think the, as the jury discussed, the vision of a town like Braddock to really activate various sites and motivate more development really defines placemaking. And uh, like Greg said, we had a, we had a very nice uh, deep dive into the O-ringer. So, um, it's up for one of the awards also. Um, I think as we, as we wrap up here, uh, you know, I think the importance of taking neighborhoods, and this is where ULI kind of is continuing the conversation, is to do development that motivates placemaking. And I think these three projects even though uh, you know they're not complete, uh, they're well in progress, and uh, they'll be a, a benefit to the to, to Pittsburgh as a whole. So we got a couple minutes. Anybody want to jump in and make some final comments? Okay. Um, so the next program is on April the twentieth, and. Uh, Every once in a while, uh, the jury uh, decides to have a jury award. And typically this happens if there are some projects that may not fit a category or uh, didn't make the finalist list, but we feel very strongly about. So that'll be on April 20th. And um, we'll look forward to you joining us then. Um, and again, Thursday, May 12th, uh, McKnight Realty Par uh, Partners is the honor honoree for the 2021 uh, placemaking. And uh, we hope to see you all there. And thank you very much for uh, participating today. Robin, what's the time on Thursday, the 12th of May? It, it's a, uh, a happy hour event. Uh, Lisa, are you still on? Yeah, I'm not. I I'm do. Not I think it starts, at four, it, it starts at four o'clock. Registration is open on the website. And um, so please feel free to register. There's some sponsorship opportunities. So recognize your companies as we are, you know, making these award presentations. And we um, really have a nice night plan. So we hope that, that you all be able to join us on May 12th. Okay. With that, uh, I will. Say goodbye and uh, see you guys in a month. And then also on May 12th. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. Thank you.